Hello everybody, welcome to EPG Partsala Philosophy. Today we are going to discuss the topic called Reason and Faith. This is uh, a topic that you will find in the paper called Philosophy of Religion. In this topic, we shall be discussing basically five things. First, the first in excluding the introduction and conclusion. In the beginning, we shall be discussing the, de the definition of faith and reason. Then, we shall be discussing four different criteria on the basis of which the relationship between faith and reason is being drawn. The first is the opposition of faith and reason in the context of logic. The second one is the opposition of faith and reason in the context of empirical foundation. Third one is the opposition of faith and reason in the context of the authority of science. So the first section will be basically dealing with the definition of reason and faith. Okay, before uh, talking about the basic understanding of these two concepts, uh, it will be important for us to know that these two concepts are polyvalent and they carry different meanings in different contexts. Many believe that, for instance, reason is the capacity for consciously making senses of things, applying logic, establishing and verifying facts, justifying beliefs and in intuitions based on new information. Philosophers have, however, narrowed down this definition into the following things. Here we have four uh, such standard uh, definitions. The first is non-violence of the principle of non-contradiction. The second one is responsiveness to empirical stimuli. Third, adjustment of means to ends. And the fourth is proportioning one's belief to evidence. Likewise, uh, philosophers and theologians uh, strongly disagree on how the idea of faith should be understood. Broadly speaking, the concept of faith may be used to mean two basic components. First, the faith that certain propositions about God are true. For instance, God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, so on and so forth. The second one says that the faith in God as the trustworthy source of all being, goodness and value. So just try to pay attention on the difference between that and in. The first sense here basically talks about the cognitive aspect of faith, which is putatively fact-stating, and the second one actually talks about the volitional aspect in which an individual entrusts herself to God as the support of her finite being. The first was is self-evident. Uh, the first, the first is self-evidence-based aspect of faith. And the second is self-transcending aspect of faith. The second aspect consists of entrusting oneself to God wholeheartedly, even if there is no readily there is no readily available reason in front of you. Now, with this introductory understanding of reason and faith, let us sort of try to understand their relationship in a more complicated manner. So in the first section, we have discussed various definitions of reason and faith. Now we are going to take up an opposition, the opposition that is usually drawn between reason and faith through logical explanation. Uh, one of the most common ways of setting this relationship is to say that reason works through uh, a logical pattern of thinking, whereas faith works or moves via logic, uh, illogical or fallacious mode of thought. 
In other words, the criterion here to distinguish between faith and reason is the logic. If we undertake a careful study of operation of faith, of logical uh, faith in religious context, we would find that faith doesn't really satisfy the canons of logical thinking. In other words, reason here gives us reasonable guidance in pursuing our ideas, whereas faith makes us unreasonable and illogical. But this standard understanding is quite problematic and it deserves our critical scrutiny. First, the standard explanation of faith in reason relationship is not supported by the long history of natural theology, both in classical India and in Europe. Philosophers and theologians often develop different patterns of argumentations which start from premises that are logical, that are based on logic and or empirical observations and then which then move through inferential reasoning to the conclusion that God exists. Such argumentations are natural in the sense that these are developed by natural light of reason. They are available to every one of us, including those who are necessarily located, not, need not, uh, are not necessarily located within supernatural scriptural context. Uh, for instance, let's take up this argument, the argument of ontological ex uh, argument for the ontologic, uh, ontological argument for the existence of God. Uh, let's take uh, one of its forms. It has three different premises. The first premise, suppose, says uh, anything that begins to exist has a reason. Second premise says the universe is, the universe began to exist third premise say therefore the universe has a cause now this argument is a combination of an a priori statement and an a posteriori statement the a posteriori statement is actually based on certain cosmological theories if these two premises are granted, then their conclusion would demonstrate the existence of God because the argument is valid. Of course, here we are not really talking about the premises, whether the premises are true or whether the cause, the term cause in the conclusion is actually uh, what the religious believers mean by God. This is actually a debatable issue. But the message is very clear that the distinction between reason and faith is not dependent on the patterns of reasoning. Uh, faith is irrational in the sense, faith here is not irrational in, uh, in the sense of violating any logical canons. Here there is no violence of any logicality, so to speak. Another standard uh, variation of this theme is to say that reason depends or it proceeds on the basis uh, of what is self-evidently true to all human beings. That means uh, individuals who base their lives on reason always work with self-evident truth. But faith on the other hand goes beyond such truth. However, this line of argumentation is quite problematic. If we look at the history of European philosophy from Descartes through Berkeley to Z.E. Moore, we'll find that there are, there's no consensus on the precise definition of self-evident truth. Descartes believed that the only self-evident truth was his own existence as a thinker. Whereas Hume argued that reason, if carefully applied, will show that self and the external world are both uh, aggregates of fleeting mental impressions which are mistakenly verified into uh, sort of enduring results. Therefore, uh, Descartes' self-evident cogito was, according to Hume, 
a non-rational belief in a spiritual substance. Now, jumping across the centuries, if we look at the world of Z more, self-evident truths are like something like uh, the truths of my having two hands, having two eyes, or my being there near the surface of this art, and so on. So there's no consensus among the philosophers on exact nature or definition of self-evident truth. Uh, more self-evident truths would be viewed, for instance, viewed by Hume as, uh, as a product of non-rational leaps across disconnected impressions. Some contemporary philosophers here in this, it is important to note that they also try to define a reason in terms of reasonableness. For them, reason simply indicates that an epistemic subject is responsive to empirical stimuli in framing justification for one's belief. But this contemporary philosophical proposal uh, can also be applied to faith because faith, as we have seen, in the previous uh, 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 topic, I mean in the previous uh, discussion, that may also be interpreted as responsive to empirical considerations. Now we shall take up another opposition which is based on empirical foundation. According to this explanation, a rational person bases her dealings with the world on what is visible, what is audible, or what is tangible, whereas a faith-grounded, I mean, faith-grounded religious person goes beyond such data. Rationality here in this formulation is grounded in perceptible data, whereas faith, on the other hand, is largely dependent on things which are not at all perceivable. However, this explanation also suffers from certain short-sightedness. Scientific developments over the last hundred years or so demonstrate that various domains such as quantum physics, biology, and so on are populated by several theoretical entities which are postulated from theoretical structure to explain the observed phenomena. Uh, for instance, electron was postulated not because it was directly empirically accessible, but because it helped the scientists to explain various surface level phenomena in electrostatics, chemical bonding, or other experimental results. The same reasoning also applies in the case of positrons, zines, for instance, or black holes, 11-dimensional space and time, and so on. In the context of phase two, natural theology often proceeds to infer on the basis of certain empirical facts about the world to the existence of a supra-empirical being. Let us uh, now here uh, take up an argument. This is, a formal, this is a formulation of a teleological argument and it goes as follows. It has again three different premises. The first premise says all entities such as watches that exhibit internal complexity have an intelligent designer. Second premise says the world is more like a watch than like say, a rock. Conclusion, therefore, is the world has an intelligent designer. Here, again, we are not concerned about the truth and falsity of the premises, but we are concerned here with the structure of the argument. It proceeds through inferential reasoning from certain features of the universe that are empirically observed to a postulated trans-empirical foundation that explains those observations. This shows that the distinction between faith and reason is not properly drawn by suggesting that the former lacks and the latter is grounded in an empirical basis. A related way of contrasting faith and reason 
is to claim that reason, unlike faith, is structured by logical principles of Occam Razor. It's a famous principle in, in the philosophical literature. Men, most of us use this principle in our philosophical practices. Now, it was uh, designed by Williams of Occam. So according to this principle, in any field of inquiry, one should not postulate more entities, processes, or mechanisms than are necessary. Therefore, rational people, according to this formulation, are always economical in their ontological commitments, whereas people of faith multiply the universe with all kinds of supernatural entities. But this explanation is also not very satisfactory, interestingly. Just as philosophers and theologians are divided on precisely what are self-evident truths, they are also sharply disagree on what kinds of ontological commitments are ruled out by Occam Razor. For instance, uh, scientific realists argue that scientific laws uncover the deep structure of reality, whereas scientific instrumentalists, a different group, would claim that these laws merely provide the summary description of regularities. For instance, the former group, for the former group, electrons are really out there in the real world, whereas the later group would say that the success of science should be explained without postulating the real existence of electrons. The second group doesn't subscribe to such reality because this group thinks that there's no violation of Occam razor here. So uh, it's not really clear whether those who accept the reality of God actually violates the principle of Occam razor for they would argue that God is in fact not more than what is necessary, but is precisely just what is necessary. The third opposition is the opposition comes from the authority of science. It's an explanation which is usually given for the dichotomy of reason and faith because it claims that Reasons are usually supported by the authority of sciences, whereas faith... Now, according to this principle, in any field of inquiry, one should not postulate more entities, processes, or mechanisms than are necessary. Therefore, rational people, according to this explanation, are always economical in their ontological commitments, whereas people of faith always multiply the universe with all kinds of supernatural entities. But this explanation is also not very satisfactory because philosophers and scientists are not really clear what kinds of ontological argue, uh, commitments are to be ruled out by Occam Razor. For instance, scientific realists argue that scientific laws uncover the deep structure of reality, whereas Scientific instrumentalists would claim that these laws merely provide the summary description of regularities. For instance, for the former group, the scientific realists, electrons are really out there in the real world situations, whereas for the later group, the success of scientists could be explained without really postulating the real existence of electrons. So it is not clear whether those who accept the reality of God actually violates the principle of Occam Razor, for they would argue that God is in fact not more than what is necessary, but is precisely just what is necessary. The third and probably the most important explanation, which is usually given for the dichotomy of reason and faith, is like this. Third, the third and probably the most important explanation that is usually given for the dichotomy between reason and faith is that 
the claims of reason are supported by the authority of science, whereas the claims of faith are backed up by superstition. But this is also very controversial because the validity of this doc dichotomy is dependent crucially on how the term science is defined. You may consider science as a methodologically structured discipline of inquiry, which is agnostic about the reality of any metaphysical claims. Or you may consider scientific statements or science as a metaphysical statement on what really exists. Now, let's sort of try to make sense of these two different senses of science. Let's call the first one science one and the second is science two. The issue here is the issue here is neither science one nor science two can actually rule out the faith as irrational. On the one hand, the religious faith that there really is a transcendent God and that we are justified in believing, say, that God is a loving creator cannot be pronounced to be meaningless by science one. On the other hand, science two itself is not a deductive inference for the scientific enterprise, so that it is not irrational to pursue scientific activity and reject science too. Let us now try to understand what these two senses are. Science, war, science one refers to a field of activities which is dominated by certain norms relating to different, uh, relating to the production, transmission, and exchange of knowledge. It's an enterprise carried out by a group of scientists, uh, uh, scientifically trained people who are active in communication, in seminars, in conference, in international journals. It's an enterprise that aims to attain maximum degree of consensus among themselves on the proposed theories, so on and so forth. In contrast, science too, which is often referred to as scientism, makes a much stronger claim. It's a different uh, 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 sense of science. It makes a diff uh, stronger claim that the only entities that are cognitively accessible and that constitute the reality are the ones which are investigated through the methods of, through the methodology of science. Central to scientism is the notion of reduction at two different levels, explanatory level and ontological level. First, scientism claims that all fields of human inquiry can be reduced to the conceptual categories of a more fundamental science. For instance, anthropology, which is an independent field of human inquiry, can be reduced in this manner to biology, then biology to chemistry, and chemistry to quantum physics. Similarly, at the ontological level for scientism, the only reality that exists is the one that is discoverable by science one, and various uh, realities postulated or studied by other spheres of human inquiry, such as sociology, cultural studies, history, and so on are nothing but complex aggregates of the entities that are accepted within science one. So far, we have covered three different oppositions. So far as the this, so far as the relationship between reason and faith is concerned, the fourth one, which is the last one, is actually coming from psychological level explanation. According to this explanation, faith unlike reason, is a psychological crutch that some irrational people stick onto because they are unable to cope with the harshness, miseries, and the brutalities of their everyday existence. They rely on supernatural powers because they do not have adequate psychological strength, because they cannot confront the harshness of the real world situations. 
according to this explanation supernatural entities are actually nothing but the projection of human fears and anxieties they rely on such belief because they do not have that courage to live in a world on their own on the other hand people who subscribe to rationality or solving practical life problems are much stronger and courageous that's what this explanation suggests however this complex sort of views runs a bit too quickly from the alleged origin of faith in an attitude of fear to its intellectual bankruptcy however this set of views runs a bit too quickly from the alleged origins of faith in an attitude of fear to its intellectual bankruptcy one of the most uh, one of the major problems with this set of views is that it common it commits the zenetic fallacy you commit a zenetic fallacy when a certain defect in the origin of a judgment is taken as conclusive evidence that it must be false the zenetic fallacy is also known as fallacy of origins or fallacy of virtue for instance let me give you an example of this fallacy for instance if one were to argue john cannot possibly tell the truth because he is a thief the question of whether or not he is actually telling lie has already been given positive answer by examining not the statement itself but its disrespectable source but this is incorrect for instance a ruthless dictator can also come up with certain criticisms of democratic forms of government which are valid and quite reasonable the point here is whether religious faith or beliefs originated in the fear of the unknown or whether such beliefs are true are logically two independent issues and this fallacy suggests that this should not be conflated one might here argue that science also originated in the human desire to exploit say the environment and can can, and can conclude that it is just a tissue of lies so it is often claimed that faith in supernatural entities or entities is a sign of psychological immaturity this shows that something is wrong with the person who has subscribed to such entities but it could also be argued that the proponents of scientism are also locked onto that false belief that only entities postulated by natural sciences are ultimately real reality it might be pointed out has more dimension than the ones available to sense experience and thus it is the defender of scientism who has remained in the infancy of humanity the defender of scientists scientism may may not really be impressed may not really be convinced by this but here it may be noted that the disagreement in this context is not actually the psychological one but a metaphysical one about what kinds of beings pop populate the universe here uh, we have seen that or we have proved in a way that faith doesn't necessarily violate any logic any canons of logic faith can also very well go with signs one third which is faith can also at times be based on empirical observations and the fourth which is the last one that faith may also be grounded in psychological maturity now having critically discussed all these four criteria we are now in a position to take up another very important analysis and that is the analysis of the rationality of faith what how does reason operate within the perspective of faith how do you mean how do you reason within the parameters of faith now in order to 
understand this, let us investigate the structure of something called worldviews. Now, the worldviews, whether worldviews of different religions such as Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, or whether these worldviews of Plato, given by Plato, Aristotle, Leibniz, Marx, and others. So here, let's sort of try to understand this very idea of worldviews. What is a worldview? What role does it perform? A worldview is a comprehensive, a fundamental cognitive orientation of an individual or society encompassing the entities of individual or society's knowledge and point of view. So this can come up, come from different uh, philosophical inquiries or explanations. So now this worldview performs two major roles. First, it develops a picture or map of the structure of reality. For instance, it will give you some kind of explanation about what kind of entities that it consists of, how they interact with each other, and so on. The second, the worldview helps us understand or grapple with the existential experiences that might crop up in our interpersonal relationships. The idea of worldview understood in this sense also then includes scientism because scientism is also nothing more or, uh, than a simple worldview. It is a worldview that attempts to explain the reality of our world in which we operate. Suppose if you reduce all fields of inquiry, if you're a scientist, if you reduce all kinds of inquiry or forms of value into the level of quantum physics and try to provide a coherent, a consistent, and an elegant view of the world and the place of humanity in it, then you are also actually subscribing to a particular worldview. Besides, uh, it is something, some, uh, here, besides here, one might also argue that uh, this is some sort of a caricature to argue that faith is an irrational leap into the unknown. For there are many traditions, there are many religious traditions which give enormous value to rationality and they do not base their beliefs in complete absence of faith. So we have Christian theologians who view this relationship between faith and reason quite uh, interestingly. For instance, Aquinas. Aquinas thinks that faith actually does not negate reason. It actually elevates reason. It elevates reason in the sense that there are certain truths, such as truth about the Trinity, which cannot be accessed through natural reason, but have to be accepted on the basis of biblical revelation. John Locke, on the other hand, would say that no, reason can actually adjudicate the debates over the scope and content of revelation. Likewise, many other Christian theologians nowadays would prefer to talk about knowing God, but not of having faith in God. Philosophers of religion in contemporary times are of the view that the experiences of the world are quite ambiguous and they can be in fact woven together into faith driven perspective or, or some sort of naturalistic perspective. So now to conclude that this relationship between faith and reason should not be actually viewed in terms of certain rigid dichotomies such as truths versus hypes, logic versus irrationality or reasonable versus unreasonable we need to consider faith as we need not cons i mean we need not consider faith as a superstition or contradictory in nature similarly reason should also not be viewed as a pure as a, as a matter of pure logic or rationality there are several layers of rationality that might come in the simple process of reasoning there may be they may be understood as two 
here one could say they may be actually understood as two competing hypotheses which aim to comprehend the reality of the world with, it, with maximal simplicity and explanatory economy. So given this intellectual legitimacy of religious faith is bound up with various metaphysical assumptions, it is not surprising that the issue of rationality of faith is an intensely debated matter. For instance, a religious believer would argue that since a commitment to scientism is not strictly speaking a deductive conclusion from scientific practices, science cannot actually pronounce on the non-existence of God. So the religious believer also might argue since science as a matter of method rules out consideration of values and purpose, it cannot answer some of the deepest existential questions of humanity which religious faith religions have tried to actually deal with the last uh, the best explanation for them for him this the religious believer that would be then the best explanation for the existence of a cosmos with ordered and harmonious principle is the existence of a divine being who affords this cosmic Structures. Similarly, a scientist who is impressed by the spectacular success of the physical sciences in understanding various aspects of human existence often argues that the ultimate explanation must lie in empirical laws of the most advanced sciences and not in any supernatural entities. So here we have basically covered this crucial relationship between reason and faith. Hope you have understood this. For further understanding, you may use the e-text that is available there in the e-part, Salah, UGC. Thank you very much.